Maybe I should get the microphone after all. You know what I mean? Do you still have it kicking around? Uh, hi. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, do we have the microphone still? I think it's probably going to be easier. Thanks. Sorry. Just give it a second. Serenade you. <laughs> what time is it? It's just going quarter past. Uh, quarter past. Six. Six. All right. <laughs> Time zone you want. Yeah, I don't know. I've been in so many. I've been in so many time zones. I don't even know anymore. It's crazy. Famous enough, Fender. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait. You should buy whatever he wants you to buy. <laughs> uh, let's see. How did I set this up? Is that it? Yeah, I think that's it. All right. Um, uh, what have I got to start by saying? I'm going to start by saying um, I have been in the studio in my pajamas for six months, Yay. literally, and, uh, uh, and consciously as well. I decided that while making the record, I spent so much time like being public over the past few years, and uh, the, it's not even social anxiety, but there's a certain amount of energy that it takes just to interact mm -hmm. with people. So I decided to just not get out of my pajamas for six months. Yeah. And then anybody that came to the studio, um, I, Mike Keneally was on this record and, and he wore his pajamas too. And Morgan was in his pajamas and uh, Anoop was in his pajamas. And <laughs> and it's like a pajama party, right? And the only ones that weren't were my, um, uh, my wife and my son. Actually, no, my son was in his pajamas the whole time too. <laughs> I figure that's the best way to start is talking about pajamas. And I guess uh, the reason I started by saying that is because... Um, uh, the transition between being in the studio and being super insular like that and then all of a sudden being in a situation where you're around people is uh, something that is in complete opposition to what I think I would have chosen for my life had I had that, that opportunity. Um, but at the same time, I think any growth that has come musically for me has been based on the fact that I've been out of my comfort zone for so long and the whole uh, social interaction has been uh, primary to uh, what I've been doing because, um, you know, without people in my life, without my friends, without my family, without all the people that I care for, I'd have nothing to write about. Like, there'd be, no there'd be nothing worth celebrating in a certain way, you know? I like the idea as well that uh, that's what death is for. Death is for uh, providing some sort of sense of value to life. So in the same way, human beings in their horror and uh, profound uh, yuckiness are also the things that make it worth writing about. So anyway, my name's Devin. I just finished a uh, record called Empath, which took me a uh, better part of a year and a half. And I'm supposed to be doing a guitar clinic, and I find those really difficult because I've got six licks, basically. <laughs> and um, as a result of that, um, I've managed to create uh, like 30 records worth of stuff. And um, 
I think maybe the best way to start this would be to, now that I've made that introduction, which is a veiled way of saying, holy shit, I'm in front of people again, and uh, <laughs> I'm actually psychologically not prepared for that yet. So I'm going to keep looking this way, and now I'll look up, and I'll say, um, why don't we start by a question? Anybody have a question? Maybe that could lead us into guitar-ish uh, type of things. Okay. We could ask about... Uh, Okay, uh, favorite color, we could ask, like, anything. Actually, the less guitar-oriented, the better, please. Well, I mean, it's going to be a guitar question now you said that. I know, that's another role, but... <laughs> Mesa Boogie has been a humongous part of your sound live for many, many years. Is that all completely gone now? No, I mean, and I think a lot of the reason why these uh, uh, products have been a big part of my life is not only the fact that I use them, but I've got relationships with the people there. Like, uh, Tim from Mesa Boogie has been, like, a friend now forever and I was at the NAMM show last year and the amount of people in my world that have become friends that are involved with the industry is such that I end up using things still because we're buddies. You know, I don't need any more gear. I don't need, uh, I, I mean, you need one guitar and you're good to go, but I got way more guitars than I sh anybody should have. But a lot of the reason for that as well is, um, which we'll get into this guitar plays a very practical purpose in my creative uh, life but also I'm friends with these guys, right? So Mesa Boogie, I use a dual rectifier with a uh, tube screamer in front of it as a clean boost. I use a Maxon OD808 and uh, I like the uh, EL34 tubes in it. And it's really cool, but uh, this last record, so what I did was I've always wanted to get like the best guitar sound. So I went into the nicest studio in Vancouver and I had all these companies send these amazing amplifiers, like every one I could think of, like all these the EVH ones and the uh, and the Mesa ones and the Friedman ones and the Soldano, everything. And I set it up with all these cabs and we went through every cab and then we found the right preamp and the right mic and it was, you know, cost a fortune to do that. And then I went home the next day and reamped it through the Axe FX. So <laughs> I think that more than anything else, I just needed to know, right, what it is that I want and what I didn't want. And so, okay, let me just think. Yeah, this is this is a guitar clinic. I should do guitar stuff. All right, so um, this here is this seven-string version of this guitar, the Stormbender, that I um, uh, designed with Framus over the past couple of years. And you can feel free to give it a shot at the end. Uh, I don't know. I don't play seven-string at all. So um, if you are interested in seven-strings, you should totally buy it because apparently seven-strings are cool. And um, I tune in this tuning. So it's... Open C, and then I have a drop G at the bottom for the seven. So basically, the way that this tuning works, and uh, I haven't actually tuned this, even though it's got the Evertune thing, I just did it by ear, so it's gonna be a little out. And I made these weird patches, which uh, kind of replicate what I'm trying to do. Um, so let's start by talking about this tuning and how it works. So from low string, it's C, G, C, G, C, E, right? So G, C, G, C, E, and then in the seven string thing, you got the G at the bottom. So the reason why this functions so well for me as a singer is because I was saying to the guys before, when I play live, um, I'll record all the parts in the studio, all the, the difficult parts, but then live, I try to hire people who are better than me and have them play the parts. And then all I have to do is have the guitar slung low and just go. That's all I really want to do live, right? But the reason why this tuning works so well for me is as a singer, that's it's like the perfect solution. So how it functions is bar chords, right? So it's a... Crunching, it's just open and just like that. That's all you have to do, right? So like And when it comes to uh, articulating the intervals that I try and choose, excuse me, with my music, because I'll have orchestras and choirs and lots of effects and beeps and boops and all these things going on. But the way that I uh, structure the rhythm tracks is I really try and keep it super simple. So a lot of times, um, you know, like the, the more complicated things, when you're in a bigger place, like an arena, if you're fortunate enough, or a festival, the more complicated and the faster the music gets, the less it translates over big areas. So what I've tried to do rhythmically with a lot of the music is keep what the guitars and bass are doing just dead simple. And I try to keep it octaves and fifths as a result of that. So this is your fifth, right? And then your octaves in this tuning are just... If you keep the rhythms doing octaves and fifths, you can apply any intervals with the other stuff in a way that the bass, like the, the foundation of the music, just remains really big. So if you're just going like... A, If 
I keep the bass and two rhythm guitars just going, all the intervals that the orchestras or the choir do can change the things. Going, so if you keep the fifths, everything sort of works in between then, and I layer octaves. So I'll have like a C, a low C, a piano doing a C, the bass is doing a C below that. If there's anything to add thickness to it, I may add another guitar doing the fifth. But that way you can apply all the octaves. You can have your minors and your and your majors and your mix of majors and minor lydians and all these things <laughs> happening with the foundation being just knuckle drag and heavy metal, <laughs> which really works for me. So octaves and fifths is how that works. But also what's really cool about this tuning is that because the strings are just G, C, G, C, G, C, E, what works on this string works on this string and also works on this string. So when, it's, when you're doing scales, you're just kind of like... These two string, these three strings are the same, and these two strings are the same. So you just go. It's really, really easy, and I think that's the reason why I like it so much. Is because again, when you're playing live, the all the complicated things, all your sweeps and all your crazy melodies. Give it to the guy whose strings is, you know, has a strap really high and, and gets it right every time. And you can just sit there and go, you know, come on. Right? <laughs> so this guitar, um, again, this is a seven string version. I just, uh, but um, I'll give you a low down. Uh, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Where am I? Okay. So I like the sound of a Les Paul Custom. I like how that sounds in the studio. It's got a mahogany body with a maple top and an ebony fretboard. It's got a shorter scale. Um, I like the set neck. I like the pitch of the headstock, but I hate how it looks. Uh, every time I wear a Les Paul, I feel like a total tool. So, <laughs> but I like the way it sounds. So we started this guitar design by trying to get the same attributes in terms of that uh, sonic uh, palette that the Les Paul has but with something that looks more like a stormtrooper, I guess, right? Um, so basically, it's a mahogany body with a maple top, ebony fretboard. Uh, on this seven string version, it's a 26 inch scale, so it's actually quite short. And on the six string version, it's a 25 and a half. Um, I like the idea of the seven string not being a particularly long scale as well, because you can sort of play it in a similar way to the, uh, to the six string and how it feels. Pitch of the headstock is is such that when I lie this on the ground, which I'm going to do always because I uh, um, think faster than I uh, am. So I put it down on the ground. The headstock doesn't actually touch the ground. So if I accidentally step on it, which I've already done, I've only had this guitar for a couple of days and I've already stepped on it. Uh, it doesn't snap the headstock in the same way as with a Les Paul where you get that sort of uh, snappy McSnapperton thing that happens. <laughs> Um, I like the sound of a set neck for whatever reason. I think it resonates better. Uh, through necks always sound sort of dumb to me in a weird way. Not dumb, it's the wrong word. Um, uh, syrupy. And um, so what I did was I asked them to do this one uh, as a through neck feel, but with a set neck construction. So it, it's sort of inset to here, but then they carved it down so it feels like that. Um, they did this one super quick uh, for NAM, and as a result of that, they forgot to put the string holes here. So change the string has been a nightmare, um, but uh, they will remedy that. Uh, because a lot of what I've done up to this point has required a lot of performance, uh, I like the lights because they're super cheesy. But um, on a practical level, you can, like on, on an impractical level, it lights up and it, it's like a cock extender, right? But it's like, <laughs> but on a practical level, uh, the side lights. So when you're on stage, you know, and the lights are off and everything's going to get super epic, you don't start on the second fret when the song actually starts on the, the third, which has happened countless times. Um, I used, the, we've got another one that we designed together called the Plank, which is basically a replica of a sort of telly style with a different body and a different uh, body wood, but I couldn't afford to fly it over, so I don't have it here, so pay no attention to the man behind the screen there, but I will play it. And uh, I'm talking really fast right now, and I think it's because I'm nervous, but I'm going to slow down in a second. Here we go. Ready? <sighs> <laughs> So Empath was a nightmare. It wasn't actually, it was really, 
a cool record to do. And I've been doing interviews for it all day and uh, and all yesterday and the day before. And I was afraid people weren't going to understand it because it's really fucking weird. Um, but it seems like the only person that didn't know that uh, like what I did was that was me. Everybody's like, oh yeah, it sounds exactly like what we expected from you. And in fact, a lot of the people that helped me with it, by the time it was done, it's like, yeah, I don't know why you didn't recognize that this is what you do, right? So apparently empath is what I do and it's uh, really um, strange, right? All right, I've run out of things to talk about. So um, can someone give me some sort of input here? It would make it way less awkward. How was Nam? Thank you. Um, <laughs> Nam is 100,000 people that you hate and 75 of your favorite people in the world. And it's if you can picture working at a guitar store with people uh, awkwardly bashing through the fastest sweep arpeggios they can, all in slightly different tuning from each other of varying degrees of quality, while sweaty, coked-out reps try and talk to you about uh, their time with Motley Crue in 1987. Uh, and then after it, everybody gets together at the Hilton Hotel and uh, tries to fuck each other, basically. <laughs> and uh, if you're not particularly interested in doing that, your days are spent with obscene amounts of social fatigue because on some level as well the uh the people that support me in the in the gear side of it provides a type of advertisement for me that the record industry no longer can provide because just you know it's just shattered in that sense so i do have to play the game and um uh i'm increasingly finding that my patience to play the game is becoming more and more transparent that i really don't care but I do care in the sense that, again, there's 75 people like, oh, my God, it's so good to see you. But I think the reason I care about that is because I've got 29,000 unanswered emails on my phone. <laughs> and over the last six months, I haven't answered many of the people that I see at NAM, and it gives me an opportunity to buy myself another six months. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, awesome. that's what NAM's Thanks like. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? I'm going to get this. It's going to be great. Once we start getting momentum, it's going to be sick. Oh, I'm going to ask him because then it seems like there's people back there, too. It's great. <laughs> yes, sir. Huge, yeah. huge, because I think that in absence of it, doing things like this would suck. <laughs> because I think the, the mechanism that allows you just to talk and, and ramble is the same one that allows you to uh, improvise live. And the, the I've got a buddy in a famous band, because I'm Captain Famous Friends, um, <laughs> who their band has always been awesome. Like they've never not been awesome. And when you talk about this band, everybody's like, that's they're the best, right? But um, he can't improvise. He doesn't want to improvise. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that he hasn't failed publicly. And I think for myself, I mean, it's like, oh, my God, dude. Like, I've been doing that professionally for 25 years. And as a result of it, I don't fear it in the same way. It's like I don't really have anything to lose. You know, I, I, I don't need a bigger house. I don't need a different car. I don't need more gear. And so my desire to play music has a lot to do with the fact that um, I enjoy uh, uh, contributing my my crap to the uh, world of crap, and uh, to meet other people, it's it's like it's a joy for me, and so improvisation is something that um, I think uh, the best solution to learning how to do it is just to go out there, put your balls or whatever you've got your ovaries on the line, and then uh, and just hope that uh, after a few incredibly awkward social failings. That translates into, fuck it, I'll go to that note, it doesn't matter. And then Victor Wooten said it really well. I remember he said, if you land on the wrong note, just move your finger in one fret in either direction and you'll be in tune, right? So, I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen if you fuck up? What's the worst thing that could happen? It's like, you know, I'm sure, terrible things, so. <laughs> but this next, this new record, like, um, so on this record we had um, uh, drummer Morgan Agren, who's been a buddy and just one of the best people you ever meet. and. Um, He's, you know, he's with Zappa and he's with uh, Frederick uh, Thorndahl and, uh, and he's really immediate sort of reactionary improvisational drummer. And Keneally as well, the guy who plays guitar and keyboards in this, in this project now, he's, he's, that's what he does. He's an improviser. And um, I think that, uh, that this experience has made me realize that what I've done over the past couple of years live has been, um, I've been trying to control it so heavily because I want it to be perfect. I like, I want it to sound like the CD. I want it to be exactly like the record. But I realized uh, more now than ever that I'm not perfect. And that pursuit has made uh, what I've been doing live get increasingly more uh, backing tracks, right? And at the end of it, I've got choirs, 
orchestra, percussion, synths, extra guitars, like everything to the point where I want it to be right. I want it to be right. I want it to be right. And then by the end, it's like you're starting to get into karaoke in a sense. You're playing, and plus every show's the same. It's like when you play in Dortmund and then you play three or four months later in, in the UK and it's the same show, you know? And there's something to be said for that, specifically if you're trying to uh, um, direct the audience through a particular emotional experience. But then a lot of times we're finding that there's people that come to multiple shows. And at that point, you're sort of looking in the front row and you're just kind of like, sorry, it's the same thing, right? <laughs> and so on the next round, what I'm planning to do is I've learned my lesson after doing two bands, Strapping Lad and uh, Devin Townsend Project, that um, maybe being in a band is, I'm not particularly well suited for it. Because my vision is such that if I have an idea that I want to follow, it, it's like I have to. There's just no, there's no question about it. And so the next round of touring, I'm hiring uh, a session band of um, really, really high level musicians. And we're going to take all this music that I've done, we're going to choose a whole bunch of songs, learn a shitload of them, and then interpret them differently. And the idea is to build it from, uh, from the acoustic show, which the intention with that is to make a, um, a statement that it's about the song, it's about the emotional content of it, and you can do it with just an acoustic guitar. It doesn't matter what you have, you don't need all that stuff. And then build it up, and then when we get back here in November, the idea is to have uh, not an entirely improvisational group of people, but something that uh, hopefully each night will be a different experience. And, you know, I was getting bored with just playing the same thing every night, and it, it gets good. But ultimately, I think when you're playing live, you're trying to connect with other human beings on some level, right? And so if you just sound like the CD, you might as well stay home, right? Yeah. All right, so let's do another one, and that'll lead me into another segue, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it naturally. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. So one more question. Yes, sir? Um, with Empath, would you say that if you look back at, like, I want to say the difficult stages you had with, like, sort of the albums like Infinity, um, and like, even with Epic Cloud now, did you find that when you were writing this record, it turned out exactly how you envisioned it to sound. If you look back at how did Epic Cloud sound when you first had the idea of Epic Cloud, when you had the idea of Infinity, because I know that sometimes they change from the initial sort of conception of it to at the end. Would you say that Empath is how you envisioned it to sound, or has it actually had some sort of transformation as well? The idea of what I do um, is rooted around a vision-based type of writing. And what I mean by that is uh, I have a very clear picture in my head of what a record is supposed to make me feel when it's done. But what the the specifics, tonally, note choice wise, uh, aesthetically, that is doesn't appear until you start taking away things from. Um, I heard a I heard a thing the other day about sculpting, where um, you basically you have a a block of something and you take away everything that isn't what the final sculpture is, and that's that's how you do it. And in a similar way, it's that way with this music. But but for me, it's about. Like with Empath, um, I knew that I wanted it to make me feel more real than I've done in the past because I think it started getting into the situation with DTP where there was a sense it was like, oh, we're the positive thinking band. You know what I mean? It's like, and everything is okay. Everything's going to be okay. But I'm at home and I'm like, what if it isn't? You know, everything's fucked, like profoundly fucked in the world right now in so many ways. And it's like, and I started feeling like, um, you can make a lot of money, I think, by trying to tell everybody that everything's going to be okay. You know what I mean? And buy a t-shirt that says, you know, everything's going to be okay. But instead, with this one, the feeling uh, that I was trying to articulate was I, it needs to be a representation of the chaos that we're being fed daily with the media and the news and, and the fear and just kids being shot and, like, you know, animals being... And it's like horror all the time. And if you've got kids and aging parents and all this thing, it's like... You know, and people were coming up to me at the end of the DTP thing as if I had some sort of um, answer, you know? They're like, oh, you know, it's good that you're doing this positive thing. And, and I'm just like, I'm fucked. I'm fucked. You know, it's like my whole life is this perpetual uh, fear-based reaction to trying to make sure I can keep my, my, my shit together. So when it started with Empath, I mean, I've been trying to meditate for years. So I started going to these classes and like... Meditation and meditation and exercise, and meditation and exercise. And the idea with that is one of the fundamental problems that has um, been a consistent stumbling block for me is my uh, propensity for overthinking. When it comes to music, when it comes to technique, when it comes to production, when it comes to everything, I have this tendency to overthink to the point where I make mountains out of molehills. So 
the idea of the meditation was, okay, well, how do you let this go? How do you allow yourself to um, have these fears and everything be part of your part of your reality without letting them get their claws into you, but not to not acknowledge it, which is what I've done since strapping. Like the whole idea was after that. With strapping, I think there was so much of um, my reaction to anger. I didn't understand anger when I was a kid. So strapping was like, I'm gonna be angry in everybody. But I didn't realize until retroactively that my reason for doing that was because I thought on some level, if I was angry, really angry, it would keep it away from me. It was almost like a shield. But you know what I learned from that was the accountability of it. As soon as you start projecting that, that's what comes back to you. So when it came to empath, I was like, how do we do this? How do we make a record that revisits that like basically takes your past and your lineage and everything that's going on musically with you lays it out so you can analyze your relationship with it and then present it in a way that ultimately through that chaos uh inspires a sense of like hope like it's fucked but it's like i can't give up and neither can you that was the whole idea and that was the vision so how different was that at the end than it was in the beginning well there was no beginning it was just, that's your end goal. At the end of this record, I have to feel that. And so the whole thing, the intention that I went through this record from the very beginning to the very end is I kept saying to myself, like, make sure that you can represent this like incredibly dark stuff without it becoming incredibly dark, right? And so I have people that help me. I have people that sort of suggest chordal ideas or rhythmic ideas, but it has to adhere to this kind of internal barometer. And, um, and it did. By the end of it, it the way someone's phone's ring. Is that me? That's my alarm. Uh, it's, not what it is. it's my alarm. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to wake up. <laughs> uh, I just got a guitar. Would you mind? It's in my jacket there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there it is. Oh, you know it. So yeah, basically, it was like I was thinking today that. Uh, the record ended up being like looking in a mirror and when I first heard the record back it scared the shit out of me I was like this is way too intense. This is way too too much But then it was almost like the people that were involved with it um, uh, It was almost like they were Helping me see that and they were like yeah, dude, this is what you this is what you look like And I was like holy fuck man like really for real and some very um, Incredible people have been involved with this record in ways that you would never expect right like um oh, i gotta wait till now i'm predisposed with the phone is it where, <laughs> sorry freddie yeah, is it my bag yeah maybe it's the ipad you see my bag i got a hawaiian bag okay. <laughs> are you find it yeah. time to wake up <laughs> so um you know so mike keneally uh a bunch of people i got uh, yeah a bunch of people right chad that's an interesting thing. So Nickelback, right? Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. This is why it's really interesting and why it was really important for this record. So um, him and I are about the same age, grew up in the same town. Uh, you know, everybody, you're supposed to hate Nickelback. That's what you're supposed to do, right? So They make me ashamed to be Canadian. Okay, well, let me continue. Maybe this will change your mind. So basically, <laughs> I... Um, I was super critical of the band. I was like, fuck that band. Blah, 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 blah. It's disingenuous. It's this and that and the other thing. Then I heard one of their songs last year and a bunch of friends of mine work with it. And so I wrote on Twitter, I like the new Nickelback song. And because I thought it was cool. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, I just liked it. And the ensuing shitstorm <laughs> that came down my neck was insane. He'd be like, fuck you. I will never fucking listen. How dare you like something I don't like, right? So. So the next day I got a text from Chad, and I've never talked to the guy before, and he's like, hey, thanks for, thanks for not talking shit about me, that was cool. And I was like, well, just to be clear, I have, for sure. <laughs> and I said, I've analyzed my feelings on that, and uh, because we have mutual friends, I had heard you had talked shit about me. And I was also jealous, I think, on some level, because that's what you do in Canada. If someone has success, you cannot be happy for them. You just have to be like, well, he's clearly like sucks cocks in hell. So <laughs> you know what to say. So it was cool because we, we, you know, it was a nice little interaction. That was cool. And I said, oh, you know, when I'm back in Vancouver, you know, if you're, if you're free, we'll just get a coffee, like, you know. And so I got back and uh, gave him a call. And uh, he said, well, why don't you come over? And I was like, oh, okay, sure. So, I mean, this, I mean, dude's got a lot of money. Right, like no lie, and I remember pulling up and just being like, "Oh." <laughs> so anyway, went in and we found we got along well, and it was interesting to me as well because his level of success was such that he's ha he's done all these things that I've never done, and in my career, I've done some cool stuff. You know, you do some festivals, you do some uh, some uh, 
you get to play an arena every now and then, but you're, there's no there's no handbook for that. So if you have questions about it, if it emotionally affects you in a way that is like confusing, there's no one to talk to about it. You can't, because a lot of times people interpret that as bragging. Like if you go up to somebody, you know, by buddy across the street, you know, he works at the, at the, um, the gravel pit. I'm like, you know, we played this really big show and people were there and it made me feel weird. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he's like, why don't you just shut the fuck up? <laughs> but this was a really interesting thing for me because I was able to say, I'm confused about this. He's like, oh, this, 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 and this, this. And I was like, oh, that's actually really interesting. I've never had it laid out that way. So uh, full disclosure, uh, 46 years old. And, you know, prog metal is not a particularly lucrative genre, right? So every month that goes by, there's money things. And I'm like, you know, a kid needs braces or there is insurance on the gear and, and it's, it's expensive. So last year when I quit DTP, there was a part of me that's like, oh, fuck, maybe I should just make a pop record. Honestly, I was like, maybe I should just put together a couple of choruses. I know that there's 600 to 1200 kids a night that, you know, are people a night that will maybe buy that. And it will kind of be like Ocean Machine, except with a bigger kick drum or something. You know what I mean? It's like, we'll start with the chorus and maybe we can make it three and a half minutes long and we'll make it about positive thinking because that way, you know, I know it's a sellable market. And so when I was with Chad, I said that. I said, you know, I'm tired, man. I've been doing this for fucking ever. And it's like, and we're still month to month. Um, would you help me produce? Because we get along. Would you help me produce like a, a commercial record? And he was like, I'll tell you what you need to do. He says, you need, to, um, you need to get over this fear. You need to make exactly what it is that you need to do. You, may, you need to make uncompromising music, and you need to turn your vocals up. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. He was the one that convinced me to make this in a lot of ways. And it was such a um, profound experience for me in a way because I wouldn't have expected that. You know what I mean? He was like, the reason why I do the music that I do is because this is who I am. And people may not like that, but this is how it comes out for me. And then watching him, because at the time he was playing his demos for his new record, and I was, he was super into it. It wasn't like he was like, oh, I've got this thing. I'm going to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. I'm going to write. It's like he had broken up with his wife, and he's like, this is a song. And I was just like, you do the same thing I do. It's just what you do results in, in something that a lot of people have problems with. But also, it's like, it doesn't mean that he's not being genuine. And in the same way, I realized from that meeting that I need to do the same thing in a way. But what happens when I do that is this gong show that you're about to hear in a couple of months. But it was just, it was really an important thing for me to, to hear that from somebody. And specifically from 